Um, so what I want to talk today um, about is why gender is now a problem in some communities. Uh, Chris mentioned that in the 70s there was an awful lot of focus on gender, of feminism within communities, and I'm talking very much about contemporary research I've been doing and a variety of what I call eco-communities around the world, and really focusing on women's participation in building. So I'm particularly interested in who builds what houses, how they're designed, and therefore how they're occupied. So for me, gender is a problem in eco-building, um, in the way in which buildings are constructed, and there are consequences of ignoring gender as an issue, and, and there are lots of ways in which this should be challenged. And some groups around the world, particularly in the US, have been challenging this gender dimension in eco-building, which I'm going to come on to. So women tend to be excluded from buildings through a variety of assumptions around their bodies, their minds, and evoking society's um, assumptions and expectations of what women do and should do. And while there are, there are a reasonable number of female architects, also in the minority, and some notable eco-builders around the world, um, there are not, that there are not more means we're excluding a wealth of knowledge, skill, and particularly labour. So a lot of the natural build projects that I visited are very labour intensive, and yet in many ways women were excluded from the process of building those um, homes. And actually that's just wasteful on a practical level. So my empirical material comes from 30 eco-communities. I was very lucky to um, get funding from a British fellowship trust where they wanted me to go abroad and bring back knowledge that would help eco-building in Britain. Um, I didn't go with the intention of looking at gender. This was something that emerged as soon as I left Britain and went to these different communities. So it's come directly out of the research. And I'm just going to mention seven of those case studies as I go through. I'm just going to draw upon them. I'm not going to describe them all. All the detail is in the paper that will come out of this conference. So I've mentioned the word eco-buildings. Um, I'm quite generous with my definition of what that means, but it, basically to minimise resource use, minimise waste, and maximise use of renewable energy and renewable materials. This means that it can be anything from a natural building made out of mud or adobe to a very high-tech um, passive house with PV and... Uh, solar hot water and all the technology you can use. So there's a, I'm quite generous in my definition, and eco-building therefore is quite a diverse and contested um, way of looking at how we describe buildings. There's a whole massive literature which I'm not going to touch upon. I think there's plenty to argue about um, as to what makes a good eco-building, let alone how to build it. So in my research, that's, I've come across a lot of, pe lot of arguments about what's the best eco-house um, and, and what's the best way of constructing it. I think it's important to just touch upon um, the gender and architecture. This is not a new issue here. People for many um, decades have noted the importance of gender in the way in which we build our houses and in the way in which we live in them. So home space is gendered. Particularly the kitchen is often historically perceived as a woman's place. And certain roles within the home, such as cleaning and childcare, are also perceived as female domains. And what surprises me, and um, perhaps I am naive in looking at communities, is that that stereotype still exists in a lot of communities. I'd expected a bit more of a progressive and gender-neutral approach. And I know there are examples where ex especially childcare has been um, taken to a different format, but actually fundamentally in the communities that I worked with, um, gender was still an issue in the way in which um, roles were considered. So I just want to draw here on the example of Dolores Hayden, um, an American who worked with a feminist movement in the 70s, where they decided that the way in which to um, liberate women in houses was to make kitchenless houses. So these are some designs where you'd have the kitchen area and all these other houses wouldn't have any kitchens in it. So that all the communal... Um, all the work that women would normally do in a house becomes socialised and communal. So, and you can see that in communities such as Findhorn in, in many ways as well. So the idea was to have kitchen, kitchenless houses. And in essence, the movement sought to value women's diverse contributions and remove their domestic burden. 
So this is something we've been working on for a long time, but something I think we're still working on achieving. When women are empowered to design their houses, they can do so in radically different ways and with significant implications for how they live in that house. And I think that's really interesting. If women are given more space for experimentation, that they might build differently and design differently. Another example is that women uh, physically building houses isn't a new concept. This is um, Taos Pueblo in New Mexico. And here, although the men would erect the wooden structure, the women would install the walls, they would um, fill them with puddled adobe, and they would be in charge of maintaining them. So actually, in many ways, it was the women's job to build the Pueblo. And this is um, a modern a picture of as it is now. So this is when women were building it. And some of it's changed a bit since um, Spanish colonialization. But the, the basic thing I want to kind of share with you is that women were the builders of that time, so it's not a new concept. I've been talking about gender. It's a very tricky concept to define in many ways. We just assume it applies to the division between men and women. I simply want to say there are two main ways in which we can consider gender. The first is biological determination, where we separate men and women as being biologically different but often we add on other assumptions to that. So it's not just about our physical being. We then add the stereotypes of what it means to have sort of perhaps different brain chemistry and different cognitive skills, different spatial abilities. Unfortunately, in Britain, um, this idea that men and women are biologically determinedly different um, is gaining currency again, and the feminist movement is sort of trying to re-arise to challenge that. Because the second key way in which to understand gender is that it is socially constructed. So although we might have basic bodily differences, everything else about our gender is constructed by society and therefore can be challenged. So this idea that women are creative, caring, emotional, mothers and homemakers, and men aren't, is socially constructed and therefore open to challenge. So for me, these stereotypes create gender roles which limit and constrain both genders into certain behaviours deemed acceptable by society. I'm going to come on to an example in a community where that had very much um, narrowed a man's opportunity for what he wanted to do. So what I really want to talk about is the kind of gender trouble in eco-building. And the myth that a lot of interviewees said to me, which is that men build houses and women make homes. So this idea that the men do the physical construction and then the women go inside and make it pretty and turn it into a home. And I think if you look deeper into that, into the different areas in terms of um, body, mind and society's expectations, we're then able to challenge what some of those assumptions really mean and in terms of enabling people to do what they want in community. So women being leaders and full participants in build projects was rare across all 30 eco-communities across Britain, the US, Argentina, Spain and Thailand. So I'd hoped for some more variety within those five countries. But more problematic than that, female voices were often excluded and women's ideas were deemed unpractical and therefore not worthy of taking seriously. I'm going to... Um, oops. I'm going to um, talk through this table now in terms of bodies, um, mind, and society's expectations. So in terms of bodies, it's often assumed that, men, that women are not as strong or physically able as men, and that is why the men build the houses. Many men equated building as primarily requiring physical strength, and therefore women weren't as good at it. This belief is self-perpetuating, especially on build sites where women may be actively encouraged to take on less physically demanding jobs. And I just want to give you an example from myself. I was learning how to make earth ships, and I was learning how to ram earth into tires to create the building blocks. I'm just someone who needs practice at something, but I don't lack strength. But quite quickly, I realized I hadn't learned it as quickly, and I wasn't working as quickly as some of the men. So actually, I, I, someone said, well, maybe you'd be better off at folding cardboard. 
<laughs> and actually, I said, OK, and I went off and did it. And it wasn't until later that I realized, hang on, why did I accept that? Now, if that's someone, I'm quite a confident person. So if someone quite confident can feel themselves channeled into different roles, I can see how it's happened in other communities. What's also really important is that actually strength is not the key criteria of building. And it certainly isn't in an era where we can use lots of different machines or we can now alter, alter building processes. So Amanda Bramble from Ampersand Sustainable Learning Center in New Mexico said to me, the physical aspect of building is a small aspect. There's so much you have to do right. You have to pay attention to what you're doing and those details or just making things plumb or level. You really have to think ahead in order to integrate what's going to come later and later and later with what you're doing now. It takes so much more than just brute force. There's a lot more important. That thinking stuff is more important. Now, she was a female builder, um, and she would ran particularly female building courses to try and prove to people that physical strength was not the, pre the determinant of building. So the assumption that women are not as strong or that strength is a key attribute required for eco-building can be challenged both on a practical level, and um, people like me have never actually struggled with strength. I tend to over-tighten everything and break things through being too strong. Um, and in illustrating that such assumptions are a form of biological determinism, that we are determined by our gender rather than our other attributes. Secondly, an awful lot of assumptions are made about women's mental capacities. Um, a myth persists that women are not as good at science, maths and engineering as men, and this in turn hinders their ability to design and structure houses. Sometimes this is blatant discrimination. There are very few female eco-architects, and those who are struggle. They've, ha they've come across blatant discrimination in their work. Others, um, it's a bit more subtle, but when you think about the words carefully, it's still quite discriminatory. So Greg Gregory Crawford, a builder at the Panya Project in Thailand, argued that the more artistic approaches to building were more inclusive, especially to women. So he said, I feel as if it's more accessible to more people if it's not a science but an art. He was talking about natural building. And natural building sometimes feels more of an art to me than a science. So because certain forms of building are more artistic and creative, women would be allowed to do it. Now, to me, that's problematic because it assumes two things. It assumes women are more creative and it assumes men are not creative. And actually, most of us who don't know anything about community know that men can be just as creative as women. So it stereotypes both genders. At the same time, of course, many women are good at science and structural design. Um, and I would hope that was true. I come from, I'm in a science college, and I work with scientists all the time. Finally, society's expectations um, tend to be evoked to place women in the home rather than building it. There's an assumption that, ma that building is a man's job and childcare is a women's job. And all the other things that happen within the home, such as cooking and cleaning and childcare, just kind of happen. The consequence of this is that women's work is rarely acknowledged, even when often it's about a lot of the building processes. So in Lamas in Wales, um, there's a house often called Simon Dale's house. Actually, his partner did an awful lot of the building work. She did an awful lot of the support work. She went and got all the equipment. She went and got all the supplies. And yet it's still labelled as the man's house. So in that sense, we often still gender people even when they've done the work. And this has consequences for men as well. In Green Hills, um, which is a community I've located in Scotland because it's not technically legal, um, the men had to take over the gardening business because both of the women were heavily pregnant and they used to do the gardening. And one of the men had been working in the building, building all the structures on the community for four years. And it was only when he had to take over the gardening he realised he didn't like building. He was a natural gardener. But because of the gender division that had happened and his assumption about his own masculinity, that he should be a builder, he had spent four years trying to build and had been quite unhappy about it. He now works in the garden and one of the women helps the building. So these assumptions have consequences for both genders. It's not just about women needing to be um, better recognised. <laughs> 
So um, I like to always include ho hopeful examples, not just identify problems. And I think there are quite a few people who are trying to address this balance. I think we can start to identify solutions, and that's really what I'm going to talk about now, this bit, um, in terms of certain groups around the world who have really tried to challenge these assumptions around mind, body, and society's expectations. Interestingly to me, um, I expected to find more of that in Britain, which I would say in terms of the community movement has some really nice progressive liberal ideas, but actually I found most of the good progressive examples in the US. So in terms of gender and eco-building, the US is definitely more advanced. So in terms of um, bodies, one of the ways in which people have been trying to deliberately challenge these assumptions around gender is to point out that all eco-builders need to learn to build with their bodies. That most natural building and anything beyond the really technical type of building requires a bodily investment in that structure. And that way, that's not necessarily natural to men just as women. A lot of people are brought up not doing manual labour and manual trades nowadays. So in terms of encouraging people to get used to that, there's quite a lot of work on, on trying to encourage bodily engagement with eco-building. As an example here, um, Paulina is trying to get people to work out the texture of the clays that they're making to make plasters. And she, the only way she taught us was physically, that you'd add a bit more sand, you'd add a bit more water, and you'd feel it. So getting back in touch with our bodies, rather than assuming it's all um, in, it's a science, per se. In Argentina, perhaps ironically for a traditionally patriarchal society, where there's a lot of machismo still, um, the community I visited were first taught natural building by two women. They were two American women, but they'd very much been taught in the way that it was about bodies and your own bodily experience. And the man on the community had said that he'd realised that he wasn't as strong as he thought he was in learning to trust his body, and that his wife actually had very different bodily skills. So it wasn't so much about gender as it was about knowing your own body and its limitations. Okay. Um, also, there are those who are building women, who are leading women-only builds. So Shay Solomon of the US is building running women-only builds to encourage people to um, express an experiment in whichever way they want. She built the Bear Hermitage at Lama Foundation in New Mexico in silence, again, to try and allow people to get in touch with their own ways of building without inference or advice from others. So they deliberately banned men even from watching in terms of the process because they thought they would try and give little comments and advice about it. So it was very much about... How can we create the space? Then in terms of minds, this is a bit harder because it requires subtle shifts in judgment. Not trying to... I'm very conscious that I can come across as an aggressive feminist sometimes, and actually a lot of people don't mean to make those gender assumptions. So it's about just proposing alternative theories about women's strengths, women's minds, having a focus on communication and asking people to listen to everyone during a build. And finally, in terms of society's expectations, it's about a language we use. So making sure that it's not just Jim's house, it's Jim and Mary's house. Acknowledging everyone who built that, or it's the community house. And we can embrace gender as a form of diversity, definitely. We are different in many ways, but not as a division of labour. So thinking about the roles we ask people to take on. Just three short points about the broader implications for this. Really, I'm interested in gender because I feel like there aren't enough of us doing the right thing ecologically as it is. So really, we need everyone to participate if we're going to be ready to adapt to climate change. So to me, it's a very practical thing that we're leaving out um, a really good body of, of labour. Secondly, I haven't thought of an alternative way than gender as a way to analyse this. I thought we could perhaps focus on our bodies rather than our, our gender, but actually that excludes the power of the mind that you need in building. So we need a holistic way of understanding how we engage with the building process. And finally, um, 
looking at gender allows us to understand that building is much more than the materials and the structure and just the practical stuff. It's a process, and it's a process that reflects community as well. So it's a process that asks us to think about all the other roles we give to each other in community and other assumptions we make about each other. So to conclude, um, gender is problematic in building in eco-communities, and I think we can do quite a lot to challenge it based on different articulations of body, mind, and society's expectations. I don't think gender is any barrier to building at all. I think we can adapt certain things, we can make adobe bricks smaller, we can perhaps do things differently. But I certainly think we are being quite exclusionary in current practices. So I want to kind of bring gender forward as an issue. We haven't solved it. The 70s were great, we still need feminism today. I would also wonder how would a gender-neutral eco-community really operate? What would it look like? Or should we allow gender to define differences at all? I think that an ecological approach requires holistic understanding of everything we do. And we, therefore, we need to deal openly and honestly with issues of gender. We need to include that if we're going to take a holistic approach. We need to include all the elements. And at the very least, I hope this talk will challenge us to begin to explore why gender matters in eco-building. Thank you. <laughs>